Nigeria records 244 new cases of COVID-19 as federal government expects 100,000 Pfizer vaccines by the end of the month. Academic Staff Union of Universities says it is unsafe to reopen universities amid second wave of the pandemic. In international news, U.S. President faces another impeachment as House Democrats introduced one single article charging him with inciting an insurrection. And in sport, Scotland suspends lower leagues to cut further spread of the coronavirus pandemic. This is ANN News. I am Ola Jumoki Ola Tunji. Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, has reported on Monday additional 1,244 new COVID-19 infections in 17 states and the Federal Capital Territory. Lagos topped 774 of their cases. The Federal Capital Territory and Plateau State recorded 125 each. Ten other states recorded cases in double digits, while five were in single digits. NCDC reports a total of 1,361 deaths since the start of the pandemic. Meanwhile, the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 has asked Nigerians to obey the protocols put in place as they complete their national identification number registration at various offices of the National Identity Management Commission nationwide. PTF National Coordinator Sani Aliyu says the government is not happy with the large crowds at NIMC offices all over the country. He said the task force has written to the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Issa Bantami, to shut down some NIMC offices of a non-adherence to COVID-19 protocols. In the same vein, Minister of State for Health, Dr. Olorini Bemamura, says the federal government may suspend the ongoing national identification number registration because of the large crowds that gather during the process, a contravention of the COVID-19 protocol and a situation that could become super spreader events. Mamura, a member of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, says this would help the National Identity Management Commission and IMC to return to the drawing board and reorder the whole enrollment process in terms of crowd management in its offices across the country. As the rest of the world now rely on COVID-19 vaccines to stem the spread, the Presidential Task Force PTF on COVID-19 says Nigeria expects delivery of 100,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine by the end of January and 42 million free vaccine doses through the COVAX facility being administered by Gavi. Correspondent Deji Badwas has the story. The announcement of the imminent arrival of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine comes at a time when COVID-19 infections are rising rapidly in Nigeria. The number of new cases per week has tripled. We were running at around 2,000 cases a week. We have now exceed 6,000 cases a week. Three weeks ago, if we take 100 samples, we get four positives. We are now getting 16 positives. The importation of the vaccines has been seen as a timely move, given that the country is in the midst of battling a second wave of infections. In the first phase, through the COVAX facility, we expect to receive approximately 100,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine by the end of January. In the second phase, also through the COVAX facility, Nigeria is expected to secure free delivery of 42 million doses of vaccines, which will be a combination of all the available and approved vaccines currently in the market. And authorities have already identified who should get the vaccine first. Priority will be given to frontline health workers, first responders, strategic country leadership, and those that are elderly and with comorbidities. But some medical experts say getting the vaccines into the country might just be the easy part. We need to put systems in place to ensure that the health workers are adequately trained because they need to protect themselves as well. 
And we also need to put systems in place to make sure that we adhere to the vaccine um, guidelines because it's not every patient, it's not everyone that, that can be vaccinated. There are some contraindications and there are some allergies and things that we have to consider. So we have a lot of training and a lot of setting up SOPs, guidelines to um, put in place before we actually start vaccine, um, before we roll out the um, vaccination program in Nigeria. Authorities are also concerned that some people are hesitant to take the jab, with many conspiracy theories circulating in the country. We already see a situation where there's evidence of resistance to the uptake of the vaccines even before they have arrived the country. It is clear that we as scientists, public health experts, and even the media need to do more to educate people on the nature of the vaccines, how they work, and the steps we're taking to ensure that only safe potent and effective vaccines are delivered to Nigerians. There's no doubt that plenty of work lies ahead to enlighten people about the COVID-19 vaccines and their importance. And the authorities hope their experience in successfully carrying out polio vaccinations in the past will help them achieve that target. The federal government says it is taking another look at the January 18th date fixed for resumption of schools across Nigeria. Minister of Education Adamu Adamu discussed this while answering questions at Monday's press briefing by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 in Abuja. He says the new development is attributed to the second wave of COVID-19 currently ravaging the country. Branches of the Academic Staff Union of Universities in separate interviews says it is not safe for students to return to the institutions at this time. Asa says although its members were ready to start work, the government had not put measures in place for safe reopening of schools. Union Chairman of the Obafemi Awolowo University Ocean State, Dr. Adiola Egbedokun, said classroom and hostel situations in universities do not currently conform with COVID-19 protocols. Chairman of ASU FNAP Federal University of Agriculture, Abeokuta Dr. Adebayo Oni, says the university was not ready to cope with COVID-19 challenges. Oni said the union had observed that conducting physical lectures with students would be more disastrous. Chairman of the Bubakat Far Balewa University branch of ASU, Dr. Musa Babayo, says the governments and institutions did not seriously handle COVID-19 issues during the union strike. Babayo says the federal government needs to release funds to universities to put proper arrangements in place for the protocols. The Corporate Affairs Commission has set an April deadline for customers who refused to validate their account. CAC Registrar General Garba Abubakar gave the warning on Monday at a briefing in Abuja. Abubakar says there is the need for customers to update their information as the Commission is considering an amnesty for a certain number of years on yearly return feelings, even though the details have not been worked out. Coming up, African stories. South Africa to subsidize COVID-19 vaccine costs. And later, international news. U.S. President faces another impeachment as House Democrats introduce one single article charging him with inciting an insurrection. You are watching ANN. The city slept. We installed a board in the middle of a park with something special hidden inside. We wondered if people would notice. They didn't. So we invited Nigerians to add their paws to the scene whichever way they chose to. Some literally added their own paws. Some sang, others rapped and even recited poetry. As they added their poles, the board came alive. Hidden figures broke free from obscurity, inspired by the crowd expressing themselves. You know you can do anything. Because why blend in when you can stand out? And 
MTN Pulse. Do you? Dial star 406 hash to join. Welcome back. This is in News. The financial challenges for African countries in acquiring COVID-19 vaccines are already enormous. Now, the ability of citizens to pay for their jobs is another concern. South Africa is already thinking of ways to ensure its citizens have access to the vaccines by working on a plan to subsidize the cost. Respondent Yulisa Injamela has the details. South Africa is racing to acquire vaccines to immunize 67% of the population. According to the health ministry, the intention is to create a herd immunity against the coronavirus at least by the end of the year. So far, the country has procured 1 million doses of a COVID-19 vaccine, a far cry from the ultimate goal. So some leading medical aid schemes have now stepped in. Discovery Health is one of them. The private health scheme will subsidize about 30% of the population for coronavirus vaccination once the jabs become available. The medical scheme funding by law is obliged to fund for vaccinations for, the, for medical scheme members. So that's somewhere around 7.1 million medical scheme members will then receive you know, funding for vaccination as part of that mechanism. In addition to that, there's a cross subsidization mechanism that means that medical schemes will match fund for an additional 7.1 million people in the broader public sector. So not only will medical schemes fund for 7.1 million medical scheme beneficiaries, but will also fund for 7.1 million yeah, public sector yeah, beneficiaries. For each person who belongs to a medical aid scheme who is immunized, an uninsured person will also be covered. The medical aid schemes have committed to purchasing the vaccines for more than their standard price. Yeah, from a, a discovery health perspective and a broader medical uh, scheme environment perspective, I think yeah, we recognize the need for us to act in you know, social solidarity to help you know, get everyone in South Africa you know, vaccinated or at least you know, get everyone access to vaccines in, in South Africa. Um, so we're you know, collaborating with government, we're pooling uh, resources and funding and pooling uh, capabilities so that you know, we've got the best uh, shot at um, accelerating the procurement of vaccine for all South Africans. At least one public health expert says with all this funding, the rollout strategy of the vaccines will be critical. Medical schemes will cover a large portion of the costs. They've even offered to pay for the non-medical scheme members in South Africa. So people not covered by insurance will be donated funds in order to get access. So I think that the, the main issue really is what is the rollout strategy and how is that to be organized? But right now, uh, it's fine making the funds available, but you've got to get access to doses. You've got to get agreements in place. Despite the medical aid scheme's efforts, a section of the population will still need to be financially covered in terms of access to the vaccine. Government has established a vaccine acquisition task team to deal with the problem. The mandate of the task team is to assist the country in pulling together financial resources to fill the gap. And as Chinese Foreign Minister Wu Yi wraps up his Five Nation African tour, he has continued to reaffirm his country's message of unwavering friendship with the continent. He did that again in Nairobi, as correspondent Enoch Sikodia reports. Foreign Minister Wang Yi was here with the message that China's friendship and care for Africa is unwavering. His visit, which comes at a time when many of Africa's economies have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, also served to reassure the people of Africa that they could rely on China's support, forging stronger and mutually beneficial ties, as well as battling against the COVID-19 pandemic, were top on the agenda. It is important that the first visit of the minister, Paia, is to Africa, uh, which sends a very strong message. China's presence and influence on the African landscape is growing exponentially from expanding railway lines, highways and building energy generation projects including hydropower and geothermal ones. Chinese farms are leaving their footprints on the continent. These projects have been backed by the Chinese government. Infrastructure projects, especially those in the energy and transport sectors, are key enablers 
of Economic Growth. Professor Masharia Munene of the United States International University in Nairobi says Africa struggled on this front until China stepped into the picture. Developments taking place were not taking place before the Chinese showed serious interest in, in doing so. And when there is that development uh, concern, it is good for African countries because they open up the countries, uh, they increase the level of security, economic activities, and they open up the global horizons to many parts of Africa. The China-Africa relationship has been on a steady rise and the support the African countries have been receiving from the People's Republic of China has seemingly added flavor to that relationship. Foreign Minister Wang Yi has assured the leadership of the five countries that Africa remains a priority for China. His visit coincides with Africa's struggle to get much-needed COVID-19 vaccines, with Western manufacturers placing Africa down the picking order in the distribution of their vaccines, some countries are shifting their search to China. Already Morocco and Egypt have sought vaccines from Chinese companies, and Kenya too is seeking the same. And the COVID-19 has helped to reinforce uh, mutual reliance uh, between the African countries and China on things that matter. Uh, containing the pandemic is one of them, but continuous economic interaction is another, and uh, of course the political interaction. The Belt and Road Initiative, which is China's international flagship project, was also at the center of discussions. The visit by the foreign minister comes at a time China continues to outflank and outspend Western countries on the continent. The Chinese government has sunk millions of dollars, much of it in loans for infrastructure projects which African countries desperately needed. China is also keen on supporting the continent on the military front, even as African nations continue to battle insurgents such as Somalia's Al-Shabaab and Nigeria's Boko Haram. When we return, international news. U.S. President faces another impeachment as House Democrats introduce one single article charging him with inciting an insurrection. And later, sport. Scotland suspends lower leagues to cut further spread of the coronavirus pandemic. You are watching Welcome back. This is ANN News. U.S. House Democrats have forged ahead with their push to impeach President Donald Trump for a second time. A single article of impeachment was introduced against the president for inciting the mob that invaded the Capitol and caused mayhem and deaths last week. A separate move by the Democrats to ask Vice President Mike Pence to remove President Trump by invoking the 25th Amendment was blocked by Republicans. As things stand, the Democrats have given Pence 24 hours to intervene or for Trump to resign. If neither of those conditions are met, House leaders say they would move on Wednesday to vote on the impeachment resolution. More than 210 Democrats have signed on to the charge. That is just short of a majority of the House. Many Republicans are said to be considering voting to impeach for the first time, despite their leader's opposition. The president has faced some blowbacks from the incident, as many businesses and other prominent institutions have severed relations with him. He's also been left with no platform to vent since he was permanently banned by Twitter and suspended by all the major social media platforms, including Facebook and Instagram. 
A Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, has warned that armed protests are being planned at all 50 states' capitals and the U.S. capital in Washington, D.C., as early as the day before President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration on January the 20th. Federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies charged with responsibilities for ensuring safety at the inauguration have stepped up measures ahead of the event. They are preparing for the possibility there could be more violence by the same groups that stormed the U.S. Capitol last week. The FBI has said in a bulletin late last week that the U.S. Capitol siege may be just the beginning of potentially violent activities by President Trump's supporters who believe they have been called to arms by the president's continued misinformation that the November election was stolen from him. The bulletin also says the groups are targeting every state's capital government offices and in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. They also threatened to harm President-elect Biden ahead of his inauguration. Meanwhile, President Trump at the behest of Washington, D.C. mayor has declared a state of emergency in the capital with immediate effect until January the 24th, four days after Joe Biden's inauguration. More than 100,000 National Guard troops will be in Washington, D.C. but this weekend to ensure safety. The ongoing lockdown in the United Kingdom has begun to impact businesses negatively, outrightly crippling some. Many businesses that had survived previous restrictions are now reported to be struggling under the new lockdown. Correspondent Ilo Abdefid reports. We are very scared. So 2020 was a disaster but 2021 could be much worse. And that's despite the UK government's recent $7.5 billion support package to try and protect jobs. These chefs are on furlough until the end of April. 80% of their salaries, up to $3,300 a month, are paid by the state. This restaurant, which has retained its Michelin status for 18 years, is now delivering meals or preparing them to be collected. Since nine months of uh, closure, with three lockdowns, we are always gradually losing, losing money. You lose energy, you lose money, uh, you lose product it's because it's perishable, you lose the wine which has been open. So, so it's everything a loss. So when you addition loss after loss during the year, it's insane. Farringdon and Holborn streets are usually packed with people. There are lots of offices in this business district. Since March, they've been mostly empty. In this part of central London, pubs and restaurants rely on the workers who commute into this area to work, but also all the other businesses who depend on the daily trade of tens of thousands of workers who normally come here to the heart of London. Shoe shops, dry cleaning businesses, corner stores and restaurants and pubs depend on customers. With a lockdown likely to be enforced at least until mid-February, the government says it's trying to save businesses from going bankrupt. Pascal's company owns six restaurants, all with different landlords and rental agreements. 50 staff are on furlough, but another 50 are no longer working. In springtime, if the customer are not back physically in the restaurant and rent are back to normal, uh, we need to, re, you know, to pay the staff normally, you have no more furlough, with no cash behind, we can close. We are in a very we are all in a very, in a free, very fragile way. Up next, sport. Scotland suspends lower leagues to cut further spread of the coronavirus pandemic. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. We are on the road every day, canvassing throughout Africa for news you really need. We follow this story everywhere, from every corner of Nigeria to the wide African expanse. We bring you what's making headlines, we connect you with news you can use. ANN, African News Network, in a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is ANN News in Sports. 
All Scottish football below the second tier championship have been suspended for three weeks because of a surge in COVID-19 cases across the country. The Scottish Football Association says it has allowed professional sports to continue as long as stringent testing protocols are followed and the second tier begins testing on a weekly basis. The Scottish Cup has also been suspended with fixtures before February the first set to be rescheduled. Trump's National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, owned by U.S. President Donald Trump, has been stripped of the 2022 PGA Championship. The Board of Directors of the Professional Golf Association of America voted to exercise the right to terminate the agreement to play the 2022 PGA Championship at Trump Bedminster. In a video posted on the organization's website, PGA of America President Jim Richardson added that hosting the tournament at the course in New Jersey would tarnish the image of the PGA of America. That is in the news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, ANNAfrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANNAfrica TV. I am Olajumoke Olatunji. Have a pleasant evening.